Well, I hope that you are doing well today. Hope that God has blessed you. Um, well, I know that he has, but I just hope that maybe we have realized today how much God has blessed us. Uh, for truly he blesses us over and abundantly more than we could even ask or think. God loves to exceed himself at all times, and I'm just thankful that he has done that for you and I today. Uh, welcome back. I appreciate you taking your time uh, to tune in, uh, dive into the word of the Lord a little bit tonight, uh, just to better understand the day in which we live and the things that are going on around us and why, why those things are happening. Uh, there should be very little uh, that's a mystery to children of God uh, because we have the spirit of the Lord inside of us. So when we have the spirit of the creator of all the universe inside of us, um, there are a lot of things that we're going to know and understand about the world in which we live. Uh, again, thank you for being here. And let's just jump right in. Uh, we have been in Matthew chapter 24, but we're going to come back around to chapter 24 in just a little while. Uh, but right now, I want you to go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 16. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 16. And I'll pull it up here on the screen for you. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. Bible says the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them when it is evening you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites you can discern the face of the sky but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Very interesting passage of scripture that I want to take you to uh, because the Lord Jesus became frustrated with his people. He became frustrated with the, those that were supposed to be his people because they could not discern the time that they were in. Now, why would he get frustrated at this? Why would, he, why would he get annoyed at the fact that they didn't understand what was going on? It was because his coming had been foretold. Prophets for generations, for hundreds of years, had spoke and written words of the coming of the Lord, and he was living out these prophecies in front of them every day. To great detail, every T crossed, every I dotted, everything that the prophets had said would happen was happening before their eyes. And yet they missed it. They missed it. He came into his own and they knew him not, as the word said. Why will so many people miss the rapture of the church? And not just those that... that have never heard of God or maybe heard of him briefly but chose not to believe and, and went all about their lives without him. But why would there be so many that at one time were ready or one time began seeking the Lord? Why will they, how will they miss the rapture of the church? How is it possible for a child of God to be surprised? Because they won't discern the season that we're in. They won't discern the time that we are in. If you go with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes and says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Now here we are studying prophecy and studying scripture, and the Apostle Paul wrote, a couple thousand years ago, brethren, you don't even need me to write it to you about these things. You don't even need me to tell you any more about these things. He said in verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of the light 
and the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Very interesting words from the Apostle Paul. He tells us we don't have a need to be told these things again. That we don't live in darkness like the world around us. The world is going to be caught off guard by the rapture of the church. The world is going to have no idea that it's coming. The scriptures that, that I read to you last night foretell that. That when the Lord comes, it's going to be like in the days of Noah. Where everyone is just going about their business and living their life as if nothing is ever going to change. And then boom, in a moment, the church will be gone. Two will be in the field and one will be taken. Two will be in the bed and one will be gone. The world will be caught completely by surprise by the rapture of the church. But Paul says, we're not the world. We're not like them. We don't live in darkness. We live in the light. So since we live in the light, we ought not to be asleep. We ought never to be caught off guard by the coming of the Lord. So tonight I want to take you to a very specific sign that the Lord gave us in Matthew chapter 24 about what would characterize His coming. Before we go there, remember the two things that I mentioned last night, the two foundations of this study this week. The first one is that God has both a natural and a spiritual people. His natural people, sons of Abraham by blood, the nation of Israel, the Hebrews, the Jews, they were God's first ordained and called out people in all the world. God also has a spiritual people, a spiritual people, those that become children of Abraham by faith, by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and repenting of their sins and being baptized in Jesus' name and being filled with his spirit. God has a natural and he has a spiritual people. But also remember that God deals with man through dispensations or ages of time. And so for every dispensation, there is a plan. There is a way that God deals with man. There is, there is a situation presented to him. There is an expectation. There's also a requirement at the end that at the end of that age, judgment will come before we move to the next. So remember that tonight as we jump into Scripture. So let's go back to the book of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 32. Jesus speaking still here. He says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So he tells them, he gives them a sign. He tells them, learn the parable of the fig tree. So what is the parable of the fig tree? What is the meaning of the fig tree? Throughout scripture, we always find God describing things to us by ways of things that we understand. Many times throughout Scripture, there are references to him being a shepherd and us being his sheep because in the context of those that would have been reading those words, and even us today, because even if you're not in a pastoral setting in that sense, you still understand that a shepherd takes care of the sheep. We learn those things by things that we understand in our world. And so all throughout Scripture, you see imagery. You see these, these things, these pictures painted so that we can understand what the Lord means. And so throughout Scripture, Israel, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people, were compared to different types of trees. One is, is a vine. And so if you go with me very quickly to the book of Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7 says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. And so we find an instance where 
Israel, the house of Israel, is compared to the vineyard or the vine. Now, this speaks of the spiritual privilege that Israel has. They were the, the owners of the oracles of God, another scripture tells us. They were the ones that first knew who Jehovah God was. They were the ones that received the promise from heaven. And so, speaking of the vine, we even read in the New Testament of how the Lord is the vine and we are the branches. And so, it teaches us about their spiritual privilege with God. Now, we also read in Romans chapter 11 and verse 17, and this echoes things from the Old Testament as well. It says, And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, that's us Gentiles, were grafted in among them, and with them partakes of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. So another tree, another plant, we see Israel described as the olive tree. And it speaks to us of their religious privilege. They, by right, are again the first partakers of the blessings of God. And we come into our relationship with God through them. Even as Jesus marched all around Judea and Galilee as he was preaching in his day, everywhere he went, he would go to the Jews first. And then he would go to the Gentiles. When Paul traveled the modern world of his day and evangelized the Gentile nations, every city and nation he went to, he would go to the Jews first because they had that privilege given to them by God. Their religion was the right one. Their God was the only one, the one true God. And so we read here of the olive tree being used to describe them. But then last but not least, and to make the connection to this prophecy that the Lord gives us, is you find it all the way back in 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 25. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. The vine and the fig tree together. You see these things placed together here. When you bring these, these pictures together, they represent something. And they teach us something. They represent the provision of two things. They represent the provision of economic prosperity. So when you, when you read about being under its branches and, and fruit coming on the vine, it is prosperity. I mean, when we pay our tithe to the church, it is, it is our first fruits. It is the increase that God has given to us as part of his blessing to his people. And then we take of that increase and we give it to God. So the fruit of the vine, the product of our, our work in the field, is always indicative of prosperity. And, and it teaches us of the blessings of God and, and the things that we would receive. And then... The scripture also talks about being under the shade of these trees. And shade can teach us about preservation or protection as it relates to something like the military. Strength and the ability to, to be protected from the things that are around you. And so we, we see these images throughout scripture. We see these, these plants being used to describe what Israel is and aspects of their relationship with God. And then here comes Jesus in the New Testament and says, learn the parable of the fig tree. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Israel. He's talking about God's natural people. Now go with me to the book of Zechariah chapter 3. And this same picture continues. Verse 8 says, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. 
And that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. So it's the same picture of what the fig tree is and what the fig tree provides. Now we read that first verse says that I will bring forth my servant the branch. Now we know in our day you can study it out and determine that it was in fact the Lord. It was in fact Jesus Christ that God would bring forth to deliver his people and to be a, a Messiah and a Savior for his people. These scriptures, even though they had significance in Jewish history at the time, they have prophetic significance because the Lord Jesus Christ would come and become the branch. He would become the, the Messiah for his people. But this same picture tells us something else. It says, I'll remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In one day. Then you find in Isaiah 66, still there on the screen with you, Isaiah 66 and 8, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. As soon as Zion prevailed, she brought forth her children. Now why, why does any of this mean anything to us? Why do all of these Old Testament prophecies about Israel and about the Hebrews and the Jewish people, what significance do they have to us? Think back to yesterday. In just a short time after the Lord's death, just a, a few years after his resurrection in the beginning of the early church, Jerusalem would be razed to the ground. The city destroyed, the walls torn down, and the temple absolutely obliterated by Rome in A.D. 70. And at that point, the Jewish people ceased to be a nation. Now we understand that God's people are never truly destroyed, that the scripture promises that there would always be a remnant that's preserved, and of course the nation exists today, so obviously God's word has been true, and it always will be. But as it related to being a nation, as it related to being a state, a group of people that had their identity and, and their geography all connected together, they ceased to be. Rome destroyed their nation, took over their land, and for the next 1,900 years, people other than the Jewish people would be in control of what we know as modern-day Israel today, the land of Judea. For 1,900 years, they would not be a nation. Think about these scriptures in the Old Testament. Who has heard such a thing that a nation can be born in a day? Can the earth be made to bring forth in a day? How could this be? For 1900 years they ceased to be a nation until, until after World War II. Now, if you think about this picture that the Lord has painted of labor pains, as soon as Zion travailed, she brings forth her children. What happened during World War II? The greatest genocide in all of human history happened. Nazi Germany single-handedly destroyed millions of and millions of Jews. And we understand that there were others that were, that were killed as part of the Holocaust as well, but the overwhelming majority of those killed were Jews, and the program existed to destroy the Jews. What could be more painful for a people 
than for, at the time, the most powerful nation of the day to seek their extermination. But when that great struggle was over and the Allies were victorious at the end of World War II, something happened. It was determined that something had to be done to at least begin to make amends for what the world had allowed to happen to the Jewish people. That some way, somehow, this people that has suffered so much needed a home. They needed a nation of their own. And in 1948, after 1900 years of not being a nation, in one day, the modern nation of Israel was born. Who has heard such a thing? Can the earth be made to bring forth in a day? Can a nation come forth in a moment? It did. In one day, in 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn. But remember the scripture says something. If we go back to that place in Matthew tells us that Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. What generation? The generation that witnessed the nation being born in a day. The generation that is present the day that the earth yielded a nation in a moment. The Lord said, this generation will not pass away until all these things, what all things, all of the signs of the end day, the end time that we read in Matthew chapter 24. He says these things won't come to pass until the generation be fulfilled. Now, there are those that, that look at this and, and feel like the word generation can mean a lot of things, and it can. I told you yesterday that, that anybody studying prophecy has to be very careful because men for generations have thought things to mean one thing, and yet they meant something else. And men can fall into the trap of trying to predict the day and the hour of the Lord and that is not what we're here to do but the scripture does tell us in Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10 the days of our years are threescore years and ten and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years yet is their strength labor and sorrow for it is soon cut off and we fly away the theologians can continue to debate the length of a generation but if we just take that scriptural definition that the length of a generation is 70 years where does that put us? 70 years from the moment that Israel was reborn in 1948 equals 2018 anything significant happened then? Monday, May 14th, 2018, with hardly a notice in the national media or even truly by the Christian community at large, Israel, the nation of Israel, marked her 70th birthday. On the same day, the United States moved their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. There was incredible opposition by the United Nations, by the rest of the world, to stop the United States from doing this. But the United Nations of the United States chose anyway to move their embassy to Jerusalem. 
which is simply this, regardless of how politicians may spin it all. It is an acknowledgement by our nation that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And that is why it made so many nations angry because there has been this effort afoot for so long to deny Israel what God gave to them. And so our nation stood up and said, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And what's interesting about this is that our nation, the nation that was the first to identify, to move their embassy to Jerusalem, was also the first nation to sign and acknowledge the existence of Israel in 1948. President Truman acknowledged as such in 1948 and President Trump acknowledged as such in 2018. Think about that for a moment. The scripture says that the coming of the Lord would come as a thief in the night. That the rest of the world would hardly pay attention. And yet Israel marked a generation of time, 70 years, and the world hardly paid attention. The world hardly paid attention. The word says that everyone would be going about their business as if nothing was any different. What is the significance truly of Israel becoming a nation? Remember the birth pangs. Remember the allusion to a woman being in travail with child. I want to show you something this is a chart of earthquakes for the last number of years. And you see that, that they are increasing over time, but you see that it goes up and down. There are peaks and there are valleys. But if these numbers of earthquakes are grouped by decade as opposed to just by year, it paints a different picture. Because you will see after the decade that includes 1948, there is a significant increase in major earthquakes. Now this is something that if you're part of, of our church, you've heard me talk about two years ago. Because of course this was news two years ago. And here we are two years later and the Lord has not returned. We are still here carrying on doing his work. It would have been foolish for any man to say that Jesus is going to come in the year 2018 because he did not. But we learn from these things that the birth pains continue with frequency and intensity. That all of creation groans and travails waiting for and expecting the coming of the Lord. Now here we are two years later. There's pestilence greater than anything we have experienced. True, there have always been diseases. There have always been viruses. And there have been those that numerically were much worse than where we are today with COVID-19. But these calamities just continue to come. Earthquakes continue to happen in places that don't ordinarily have earthquakes. Tsunamis that have not been seen for a number of years or perhaps hundreds have occurred. I mentioned yesterday the flooding in Houston was considered a 1,000 year level event. The calamity just continues to come over and over and over. The signs of the times point to us being in the last days. And the Lord said it is in this time. The generation that sees 
the birth of Israel shall not pass away until all these things come to pass. Where must we be on God's timeline? Where must we be on that heavenly calendar? I don't know the day nor the hour, nor shall I ever know in this life. But I know his coming is very soon. Remember the dispensations. I told you at the very beginning to remember that God had a natural and a spiritual people. Remember the dispensations of time as well. The time of the law came to an end when the Jews rejected Jesus. Now I know that there were many Jews that believed. That's, what, that's who wrote our New Testament. And we know that the church began with the Hebrew people. But we also know that as a nation, that their institutions, that the authorities of their day rejected Jesus and crucified him. And when his own people rejected him, his message was turned to the Jews, I mean, to the Gentiles, and we were grafted in. Our day only began when that day came to a close. So what happens at the end of our day? What happens at the end of our day? The Bible teaches us that he will return to Israel once again. Why is that significant for anybody watching tonight that's not Jewish? Why is that significant? Because when the Lord returns to Israel, he closes the door for us. Just as God spoke to Noah and said, the day is going to come that I'm going to destroy the earth by a flood. Everything remained the same until the Lord said, Noah, it's time to get in the ark. Everything in the world remains as it has been until Jesus calls us home and he returns to Israel once again. What am I saying tonight? The Lord said, watch the fig tree. Pay attention to the fig tree. The fig tree, Israel, is the sign. I've heard it said, I have read it myself in more than one place, that it just seems as if Jerusalem has always been the center of history. It's always been the center of everything. The land of Judea is where life began. And it is where it will end. It is where the Lord started. And it is where he will bring it to a conclusion. Jesus said, watch the fig tree. When the world's eyes turn to Jerusalem, our day is drawing to a close. The generation that saw the birth of Israel is rapidly passing away. There are fewer and fewer of them remaining. We live in a day when the term OK Boomer, it's a byword, it's a joke. It's somewhat of a derogatory comment to an older generation that may seem like they're not so in touch with, with modern things. But it's a subtle reminder that the generation, the baby boomer generation, that saw the fig tree put forth leaves in a day, that saw the fig tree put forth both economic prosperity as a nation and the protection of a military in a day, that that generation is fading fast and will soon be gone. The last thing I'd like to read to you tonight, I don't have to put on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, if you look at Matthew chapter 25. Verse 1, the Lord continues to preach. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven 
be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Why did Jesus teach this story? What's the purpose in giving these pictures if no man knows the day nor the hour? If no man can predict it, then why continue talking about it? Because although none of the ten virgins knew the day nor the hour, they all knew he was coming. And they all knew that his coming was soon. They had lamps. They had wedding garments. They were in position. But while he tarried, they all slumbered and slept. We're all guilty at times of a little nap in our spirit. All of us have had seasons of our walk with God when perhaps we weren't as on fire as we should be. But whether our lamps are filled or not, He is coming. Whether we are ready to meet Him or not, He is coming. And these things that the Lord teaches us in Scripture tells you and I today His coming is very soon. Is he going to come this month, Brother Jeremy? Is he going to come this year? I don't know. Is he going to come next year, the year after? I don't know. But I cannot study Scripture and find hundreds and thousands more years remaining. There are too many prophecies on its pages that have already been fulfilled. There are too many things happening around us that are all too familiar to the words of our Lord Jesus for me to think that his coming is far off. I don't know the day nor the hour, but I know he is coming. And his message is still the same. Be ready. Have your oils filled. Have your lamps trimmed. Have your garments ready. Have everything prepared because the bridegroom is coming. There's no time today to be asleep. There's no time to be lazy about the business of God's kingdom. It's almost as if we can hear the footsteps of our Lord coming down the road. He will soon call His church home. Can we pray together? Lord Jesus, Most Heavenly Father, we thank You for the privilege that we have today to know that your coming is so very soon. Lord, we know that your word teaches us that a thousand years is like yesterday to you. It's been such a short time since you have gone and such a short time remains until you come. Lord, our hope is in you. God, we look into the heavens for we know that our help soon comes 
Lord, I pray for those that are listening to me tonight whose lamps may not be full, that you would fill them with the Holy Ghost. God, I pray for those that are listening tonight whose garments have not been washed and made ready for that wedding. God, I pray that you would cleanse them. I pray that you would wash their sins away. Lord, I pray for those, for all of us that are waiting for your coming, that we would not be caught sleeping. Lord, wake up our spirits tonight and let us commit all of ourselves to you. We pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for being with me tonight. Thank you for journeying in the word of the Lord. The Lord should tarry so long. Tomorrow night we'll come to you live from the FAC sanctuary. Uh, we'll begin at 7 p.m. with a little church with some worship, some time of praise, and then we'll continue on in the Word of God. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name.